So the book Working with the Grain and this talk are about approaches to development policy making and implementation. Development practitioners have come, in my view, to the end of a long road and are very much at the beginning of finding new pathways forward. I'll give you a sense of what I mean. For the past half century, the approach of development policy has been to double down. In the first decades after the um, formation of the World Bank, the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, the view was that the way you achieved development results was to invest in investment projects, that a new project, the returns from capital drove development forward. And that was the heart of development for some decades. By the late 1970s into the early 1980s, it had become apparent that the returns on projects were relatively low. And so there was a doubling down. The sense was the reason for the relatively poor performance of projects was because that the incentive environment within which those projects were being undertaken was distorted. The solution was to adjust the incentive environment, to get prices right, and to go through structural adjustments. And then it was expected this combination of um, a, a transformed incentive environment and investment would generate development. The trouble was that by the early 1990s, it had become apparent that the effort to transform the incentive environment wasn't working out quite as expected either. And so once again, the inclination was to double down. The reason why the incentive environment was not, th that the efforts to reform the incentive environment were not producing the outcomes that were desired was because it, it became understood that incentives and markets were embedded in institutions and that unless you got the institutions right, you weren't going to get results. And so that led to a sustained effort to strengthen and improve public management. But it became apparent then that public management systems themselves were embedded in a broader set of institutions. And so what was the response? The response was to double down again and to embrace the good governance agenda as a platform for development decision making. And it had all the elements that we're familiar with um, that make up good governance, accountable government, strong rule of law, um, right to information, a public sector which is right-sized and used public resources well in which corruption is combated, and a business environment with a level playing field that provides strong property rights. Now that agenda, on the one hand it's motherhood on, and apple pie, on the other hand it is not a strategy. What it is is a set of aspirations. And what it is, as Frank Fukuyama would say, is it describes Denmark. It doesn't describe the pathway for getting to Denmark. So in a sense, we found ourselves, this process of doubling down and the getting to this agenda produces this rather extraordinary circumstance where, in a sense, the mantra of development for a decade or 15 years was good governance is necessary for development. In other words, the path to development is to solve the development problem before you begin. Now, the evidence that was often adduced for that conclusion was a graph you can use a variety of different variables with a scatter plot that looks something like this you look at the relationship between income and one or another governance institution you see the correlation that's there you notice that high income countries have strong governance that low income countries have weak governance and there the assertion follows good governance is necessary for development but it doesn't follow it doesn't follow first in just a formal statistical sense that correlation is not necessarily causation. It also doesn't follow because all, even if you assume that, there are these, that governance and development are causally related, how they are causally related is an open question. And indeed, as I'm going to argue, and I, I think much of the literature underscores, governance and development co-evolve, and they co-evolve with leads and lags. So if we want to understand the interrelations between governance and development, we need to understand the pathway for getting from here to there, recognizing that there is no one pathway, that there are potentially multiple pathways. And this talk is going to explore that. It's going to explore it in many ways. It complements um, Frank 
Fukuyama's two volumes because it fo my, the time horizon at which I come at, these thi at come at these things is the time horizon of a practitioner. The question that I'm consistently asking, but I try to frame it broadly, is given our understanding of the way things are in a particular type of setting, what are the creative actions that we can take now that can add value and create a better set of opportunities five to ten years from now. So my time horizon, from the years I've been working, think of it as a decade long time horizon. We'll be addressing, as I proceed, three, three sets of questions, three major themes. First one is explore this notion of multiple pathways. How opportunities and constraints, how the incentives vary across each of a variety of different pathways. A goal here is the, dis you know, well, come back to that. The, the second major theme is once we let go of best practice ways of thinking about policy, what's the best practice, once we let go of that, the question is, what are the creative ways forward in weaker governance settings? And I'll be spending quite some time on that. And then the third question, a large question which emerges, and it's emerged for me, frankly, with increasing weight and salience as I've wrestled with the themes in this book is, is an approach which I call here cumulative incrementalism. Is that approach, which I'm also going to argue is the, is the feasible way forward in many of the early stage third wave democracies, is it good enough as a platform for moving um, development, for democratic development forward? So those are the three questions. Just to give you a brief sense of the intellectual pedigree of this work. There are three parts that underpin it. I'll sort of note them and then I'll punch straight in. From early on, even my PhD years when I was working with Oliver Williamson and some of North's ideas, I've been strongly influenced by the new institutional economics. The piece that Larry mentioned on regulation was an effort to think about how different broader country institutional contexts shape regulatory options. So there's that thinking about the interaction between context and institutions. Then Beginning in 2005, I co-taught for three or four years with Frank Fukuyama. We wrote a piece together on how governance and growth interact. You'll see some of the elements of that come through in um, what I'll describe. And then in, more recently, in the last four or five years, I've been working with the team involving Doug North, Barry Weingast, and others around their work on limited access orders, and particularly in that work that work emphasizes the distinction between personalized institutions, personalized rules of the game, and impersonal rules of the game. And it explores how one class of rules of the game might, can transform into the other, arguing, as they do, that actually always and everywhere, if we want to understand the development trajectory of any setting, we, that begins with personalized rules of the game, and they become impersonal over time. Now, that, interestingly, in that project, one of the other collaborators in it was a fellow called Mushtaq Khan from SOAS at the University of London who has put a very strong emphasis on political settlements. I'll say more. And so this, is the, this in a sense, is the, in, is the intellectual foundation around which what I'm going to describe comes. And I'm going to begin, though, by just jump straight in. Well, and our roadmap, our roadmap then is in these parts. I'm going to first frame the issues around this notion of from best practice to good fit. We'll talk that through country patterns, approach to reform, then drill down in some depth into the dilemma that I posed about um, pathways of um, democratic development. So that's where we're going. And let me begin by plunging straight into the analytic frame, which provides the backdrop for the applied efforts that I make in working with the grain. So, Part of the place where development strategists have gotten themselves stuck is the following. That doubling down process that I described for you was a process which was endlessly driven by best practice. There's a view out there that there's the one right set of policies. When you find them, you're going to get the results. And if you hadn't found them, it was because you hadn't been bold enough. And so that, but that comes to the end of the road. And at the other end of that, you have work by um, Bill Easterly, who distinguishes between planners, his term for the best practice type, and searchers. Searchers who, who, recognizing that every country is unique, grope in the dark, 
seeking to find creative ways forward. Um, update on that searcher framing of development is in current work um, involving Lauren Pritchett, Matt Andrews, and others, which they call problem-driven iterative adaptation, which again is process-oriented. How do you search? How do you learn? For my taste, the problem with these frames is that they don't enable us to think systematically about different kind of settings and to learn in a systematic and co coherent way from one setting to another. What this um, simple framework does is it offers a typology building on the material I described earlier which distinguishes between five or six very different points of departure each of which involves a distinctive set of incentives, distinctive set of constraints, distinctive configuration of power and rules of the game. If you look at it, on the horizontal axis is what I described earlier. That's the distinction among institutions, rules of the game, and whether the rules of the game are organized around personalized lines, deals in between specific groups, specific individuals which apply specifically amongst those players and those actors, or whether there are impersonal rules of the game that apply equally to all who are defined as having standing. So that's one axis. It's a continuum. We'll break it up into two cells. On the vertical axis, you have the distinction. If crudely, you could say, well, we could just write down authoritarian and democratic. But there's an underlying logic to the distinction dominant and competitive, which I want to note because it plays out later in, discuss in the discussion. In dominant settings, you have power consolidated and monopolized by a single actor or group of actors if it's a party. In competitive settings, you have multiple actors, each of whom are relatively equal in power, but who've agreed that the way they'll get, they'll decide who gets to govern for a period of time is through an election. So if you take the cell, you've got the bookends, and the bookends are not the focus of this talk. You've got the bookend of Denmark on the far right, which is sustainable democracy, countries that have got locked in, sustainable and legitimate rules of the game functioning democratically. You've got the bookend on the left, which is obviously a critical theme, but it is not one which is the focus of my work, which is countries that are endemic, in endemic conflict. And then you have the four cells in the middle. And much of the action of this talk is going to be around those four cell cells in the middle. And again, just to remind you of the roadmap, we're talking about good fit. Good fit, in terms of policies and institutions, needs two things. It needs to have a way of distinguishing among countries, which is what we're going to do with a simple typology. And then, good fit is only helpful if it's complemented by a menu of alternative ways forward. So you're able to talk about different parts of that menu and how, that, how they may or may not be relevant in each of the different settings. So we're now, for now, we're in the part of this discussion which is focusing on the patterns across the countries. And let's look at these cells. And let's begin with the top left. Top left cell are those settings where political power is consolidated. You have dominant leadership. And the rules of the game are personalized. Now, just to make an obvious point, dominant and discretionary does not mean developmental. Dominant and discretionary can mean General Mobutu Sese Seko in Zaire. It can mean Robert Mugabe in Zimbabwe. It can mean Ferdinand Marcos in the Philippines. It can also mean the Chinese Communist Party in the 1960s and 70s. It can also mean Korea under General Park in the early 1960s, settings where power is indeed consolidated and in the book the two examples that I probe are the example of Korea with General Park and also the example of Ethiopia in the two decades um, during which time Mele Senawi was governing Ethiopia. But just briefly, I'm sure this is all familiar to everybody here, the Korean story is that Korean, a Korean Korea Inc., a development trajectory driven by quote, partnerships between business and government, but with government very much in the driver's seat, drives a quarter century of hyper-growth in that setting. A quarter century of hyper-growth with 
in one book describes partial mutuality in that relationship, cooperation between business and government, but with the understanding on the part of business that it was wise to cooperate because the costs of a failure to cooperate were high. And this process over the course of a quarter century, and I will, well, let me do this one first. Over the course of a quarter century, this, this framing, by the way, it's from the paper that I did jointly with um, Frank Fukuyama. He uses versions of this in his work as well. Over the course of the quarter century, strong, capable public sector drives growth drives a transformation of the private sector, the rules of the game. And in Korea, in the period 1987, over the subsequent decade, in a sense, in terms of the institutions, you can, Korea moves progressively through this period from dominant and discretionary to an increasingly rule-bound dominant system to become, it's been interesting as I talk about, I mean, I ask people, so what do you think of as the most successful democratizing country of the last 50 years? I've tested that question out, and some people will refer to the some countries of the former Soviet Union, but many will, after some reflection, say Korea. And we need to keep in mind in that context that Korea's pathway to growth was one in the first quarter century of that successful half century was driven by a dominant and discretionary set of rules of the game. So that's one pathway. Second pathway is this one. And you might look at this and you say, and what this is describing are countries that had gone from dominance but rule bound towards more open and competitive. Think South Africa, South Africa's democratic tra transition in, 19, in the early 1990s, 1994. You might want to say Thailand in this type of setting. And you might ask the question, well, what is the difference between that class of countries and the countries that moved in that direction. And the difference is in a variable which a two-dimensional diagram can't capture, a third variable. It's the degree to which there exists in these settings unresolved economic or social tensions in which in some sense the democratization is a gambit to try to resolve them but, it, they, but as of that process, South Africa 1995 success, has a hugely successful democratic election. It has a rule-bound constitution, but it also has, as the data increasingly make clear, among the, if not the most unequal distribution of income in the world with that distribution of income being correlated strongly with race. So in this, sec in this second class of countries, this class of countries here, you see a transition to democracy, but there's a large open question that remains. The open question is, will the unresolved economic and social pressures produce, will they get resolved over time through democratic contestation working its magic, or will they reverse? Will there become increasing pressures for reversion to dominance, as seems to have played out in Thailand? Or will the mechanisms of political control, notwithstanding the presence of relatively strong formal rule-bound systems of government, will the mechanisms of political control and managing elite contestation produce increasing patronage and patrimonialism, which arguably is what's playing out in South Africa? And notice that the set of issues that arise there, they're clearly different from settings that hadn't democratized, they're also different from the kinds of issues in this setting. So this is another class of problem. I discussed this in the book. There's a chapter around these. It refers to the South Africa case in some depth. But I'm not going to speak further um, to that set of problems in this talk. What I'm going to focus much of what I have to say on is this bottom left cell. These, if you like, you can think of these as many of the countries that democratized in the third wave of democratization in the late 80s and the early 1990s. For a variety of different reasons, there was a political agreement to shift this nature of inter-elite relationships from pl playing out within a dominant setting to become electorally competitive. However, these are settings where the rules of the game, other than the agreement that, they, that elites would resolve their contestation by election remained personalized and ambiguous. 
And so if you think about this type of setting, and there are, when one looks at the data, there are 30 to 40 countries that one would locate in this type of setting. If you're an organization like the World Bank and you look at this list, it turns out many of them are the countries with which an organization like the World Bank works. So just to summarize the characteristics of these settings, there are only small disparities in power between the contending factions. Beyond the agreement to sort out contestation through an election, there are very few other formal rules. And as we've witnessed in the last couple of months, even the rule of sorting out power through contestation by an election can be challenged, as we've seen in the Afghanistan case. Time horizons are often consequently short. And the basis for political stability, and here I'm drawing on the work of the North Wallace Weingast work and also the Mushta Khan work, is, if you like, the discretionary conferral and withdrawal of favor. If one wanted to be technical but actually somewhat inaccurate, one would say one's talking about how rents get allocated. To make the point in a more colloquial way, the basis for stability in these types of settings is around is the allocate who gets the jobs in the public sector who gets the procurement contracts who gets access to natural resources who gets monopoly privileges who gets the tax breaks who gets them sometimes your allies get them because it's a reward to your allies to hold things together Sometimes your opponents get them because it's the way in which you buy them off to keep the peace. But the key point to be made is each of these are, and each of what I've described are directly contrary to what one thinks of as, quote, good governance and good development policy and development strategy. But they are the basis for political stability and political order. Now, that's the bad news. The good news is that this type of pattern and there are about 10 to 12 countries that emerge in the book focused in the 2000-2010 period, can be compatible, can be compatible with relatively broad-based and sustained economic growth. And the poster child for this is Bangladesh. So Bangladesh, as many of you might know, was rated by Transparency International in 2001 and again in 2005 as the world's most corrupt country. If you look at Bangladesh as of the current period, it's still rated in the bottom quintile on measures of corruption. Bangladesh has been through a series of contested to the point of chaotic elections. One of the themes in the book is to explore the nature of those dynamics. But Bangladesh has also had rather extraordinary gains in poverty reduction through this period. The real growth rate's about 6% throughout the 1995 to 2008 period. Gross primary enrollment is up significantly. That's been true everywhere. But look at the under five mortality rates. The death of children under the age of five, and this is 1970, which is before um, the civil war that led to the creation of Bangladesh, is 235 per 1,000. It falls consistently and systematically to the point that it's only 52 per 1,000, one-fifth of what it was by 2009. A lot of detailed discussion in the book. I'll come back to some of it later in, the, in a different kind of context. And how does, how does this happen? How does one get this combination of seeming governance and institutional dysfunction on the one hand and broad-based poverty reduction and growth on the other? I'll give you a flavor of it as we proceed. But what I want you to take for now is simply keeping in mind that basic framework. What we've done is we've used a series of concepts to produce a relatively simple typology which gives us one half of the good fit problem. The half of the good fit problem that says here is a set of distinctions amongst different types of countries. Now let's look at the other half of the good fit problem which is different approaches to reform. And I'm going to begin here. How many of you are familiar with that, that picture? Okay, so this comes from the 2004 World Development Report on providing better services to poor people issued by the World Bank. It's, interestingly, this is part of how organizations learn to speak to themselves. It's regarded by people inside the World Bank as seminal, and it's regarded as something which 
consistently guides how to proceed with service delivery and poverty reduction. But basically, it says something relatively simple. Essentially, what it says, well, let me put it differently. Its point of departure was the following. Its point of departure was, in preparing that 2004 World Development Report, was to note that shortfalls in services could not simply be explained by shortfalls in finance. There were many settings where there was abundant money available, but there were no results. Nor could it be explained by shortfalls in capacity defined in some narrow sense of skills. Plenty examples of skill with that skill plus money doesn't produce outcome. The heart of the story that was being told here was that shortfalls in service provision resulted from shortfalls in accountability. And if you wanted to understand those accountability relationships, you could think of them as a set of nested principal agent relationships. So let me just give you the flavor of it working backwards. So you've got frontline service providers. Think of health clinics, think of schools. Those are embedded in management structures in line ministries. So you've got a line ministry. So in a sense, they are the agents to the line ministries, the principal. But those line ministries receive their resources and their mandates and their goals from high-level technical policy makers think of them as the Department of Finance which decides how resources are going to get allocated in a particular setting. So the Department of Finance is the principal to the line ministry that's the agent. But the Department of Finance, the Ministry of Finance is itself an agent to the politicians who are the principals who set the goals. So we're working our way back up a set of principal agent relations. And the politicians, in turn, are the agents to the people to whom they're accountable. And so you have a set of hierarchical relations that go all the way from citizens through the political process, through the policymaking process, to the front line of service provision. And what this 2004 World Development Report did was it said we can think about this as two predominant chains. One of these chains is the compact. It's the, it's the compact, it's the relationship, set of relationships that link the policy makers to the frontline service providers. And so one reform task is to enable that compact to function better. And if you want a three-line summary of what the new public management is, that's what it is. Okay, it's make, it was, uh, how do we make that compact work better? The second part of the chain was the voice relationship the relationship in which citizens <laughs> through voice hold politicians to account. And if one, and there's a very important aspect of this that is embedded in this way of thinking, that if one wants to strengthen the effectiveness of citizen engagement in the provision of services, a theme that I'm going to come back to, the way to do it by this logic is to strengthen not just voice in some amorphous way, but is to strengthen specifically the voice relationship through which citizens hold politicians to account. So using th this frame, it provides an agenda which continues amongst many key players inside the World Bank to be the guiding agenda for how do you improve services, how do you get better policy, how do you fix how, well, how do you get strong technocrats there, how do you fix the compact relationship, and how do you fix this voice relationship through which citizens hold politicians accountable? But now the question arises. Using the country framework that I teased out for you earlier, for which parts of that might this way of thinking be useful? Because And notice, by the way, the implicitly that logic lies behind best practice reforms. Best practice reforms and typically, you know, what you... Get the smartest people in the world and find the politicians with political will and you get the right policies done, leaders decide and they're implemented. And that presupposes this relationship is working. So, if we look at the dominant parts of the typology and particularly think of those as discretionary and dominant but developmental, in principle the compact can work in those settings. In principle the political leaders can set the terms and then can hold 
the layers of the bureaucracy accountable for results. In a sustainable democratic setting, both relationships work. The problem is, what about the setting? What about, if you like, the early stage democracies where the, where the factionalization, competitive play rules of the game are, person, are personal? So let's think about that. So in that world, the voice relationship doesn't work. What you have is politics is a contestation amongst multiple contending factions. It's worked out through some combination of muscle power, patronage, and clientelism. It's not worked about citizen voice in relation to services. Hierarchies don't work either in that world. Because in that world, what you have is that the, the tools of power and of political maintenance are patronage jobs and patronage procurement contracts, to oversimplify. And so, that, so the, the purpose is not to use resources to achieve results which gets passed down the hierarchy. So, so the hierarchical pattern doesn't work. Also in that world, what you have in consequence is in each of the spaces where these hierarchies are broken, you have much higher levels of discretion amongst your public officials at every level. They're not embedded in vertical relationships of accountability which are operating for them. And in addition, in this world, you have many, many layers through which various non-governmental actors, be they civil society organizations, be they local communities, or be they um, influential business lobbies, try to exert pressure. The, the long route said that the only one that really is important is the one of civic pressures exerting, of civic of civil society exerting pressure through the vote relationship. In a concession to a broader framing, that, that they also spoke about a pure short route in which communities, users of services, can exert voice in relation to frontline service providers. But as we begin to see, many who work in this space have contested the degree to which that actually can be effective. But they frame this in such a way that these Middle layers, the, and this is actually a critical point, that if you think of the world just through that triangle I described, then the two places where civic engagement happens are either the voting relationship or the user of service relationship. In fact, especially in settings where you've got broken hierarchies of this type, contestation, lobbying, influence seeking happens throughout the chain of relationships between government and civil society actors. Mid-levels of the bureaucracy, many different layers where that can happen. So, so here's, here's a key point. Ordinarily, discretion in these middle spaces is associated with dysfunction. And the assumption is what you've got is you've got broken hierarchy, you've got public officials with discretion, and they are going to use that discretion for private, personal, self-seeking means. But all we can say with some accuracy is what you have is you have discretion. Discre and the purpose for what that discretion is going to be used is dependent upon a combination of the goals of the actors with discretion and the variety of other actors with whom they might work. And so this brings us, if you like, to the second way of thinking about how you achieve development results in difficult government settings. You could say, well, if you're in a difficult government setting and it looks like this, what you need to do is to go backwards and clean up the politics and the institutions so that you can allow the long route to work. But Everything that we've seen, I think, tells us that that is a many, many decades process. Alternatively, you could take this reality as your point of departure. And you could think that the lands in these, that bottom left quadrant, in these personalized competitive settings, the landscape in which one's seeking to achieve development results comprises many, at least partly separable nodes of engagement. And each of those nodes of engagement will look something like this. What we've just done 
um, in terms of institutional economics is we've just moved from a principal agent way of framing the problem to a multi principal way of framing the problem. Whatever the particular node of engagement where you happen to be working is, what you have is you have multiple principles. Those principles, different parts of government, different influences that are coming down on the same public official because the hierarchy is not as simple and clean as it's regarded. And you have multiple stakeholders. You have some stakeholders who are protagonists of trying to achieve the development goal that you have in mind. And you have others who are seeking to predate on these resources for personal purposes. And the question that arises is, can you achieve a collective action outcome which is developmental in orientation? And that needs two things. The one which Eleanor Ostrom underscores is it needs the capacity to cooperate amongst the protagonists who want to work together. And that can't be taken for granted. It also requires a configuration of power at that local level in which the protagonists of the developmental outcome are stronger, are capable of trumping the protagonists that are seeking to predate upon the resource. So at a general level, that might seem tautological, although notice what we've done. We've said in a world, that personalized competitive world, where we cannot just assume a functioning set of hierarchies, we want to be thinking about multiple distinctive developmental games. We want to ask how they work out. But then the critical additional step, if you're interested in the making of policy, the critical additional step that follows is to ask, so what can you do to change the odds so that in the particular site in which you're engaging, the outcome which you get is more likely to be developmental. And you can think about how you change the odds in as involving a spectrum of, if you like, second best options. At one end of the spectrum of second best options is the option of saying, let's narrow the ambition of what we're trying to achieve. But let's narrow it in a very particular way. Let's narrow it in such a way that we crowd in and work with stakeholders whose goals are consistent with that development ambition, even if they're, yeah, I'll, I'll give examples later. Let's narrow it and, and let's try to define what we're trying to do so we don't have to directly confront stakeholders who would be opposed to what we're doing. Narrow, let's, fra let's scale back towards a second best set of options. The second option is let's change the configuration of players. Let's see if there are ways of engaging that bring new stakeholders to the table so that you can alter this balance between predatory and trumping influences in favor of the developmental outcome by how you engage and how you define it. Almost any initiative that you take on plays out somewhere along that spectrum. So, to summarize, and I'm going to pause briefly before we move on, what we have then at this point is we have a framework for thinking about fit, good fit. It's not a cookie cutter. This is not, you know, we're operating at a level of generality where what we're coming away with is not this is specifically what should be done in a particular setting, but it's rather this is one path of direction of movement. This is a different path of direction of movement. If a country predominantly, because the typology itself is a set of ideal types, if the predominantly, predominantly has one set of characteristics, then this is the way to think about the available options. If the country predominantly has a different set of characteristics, here's a, another way of thinking about that options. And where we're going to go in the last part of this talk is we're going to drill down in more detail as to what this might imply for that bottom, that bottom left-hand cell, specifically framing it more broadly, whether an approach of cumulative incrementalism can be a pathway of democratic development. But let me just pause briefly here, see whether most, that anyone has any clarifying questions at this point, because there's been quite a lot, around, spe specifically around this. Anything on anyone's mind? No? Ah, oh, thank you. So, if you go back to your typology, you have this little thing on the left that's called a Mm-hmm. And then it says settlement, and then you have a typology. When I would assume that the bank is trying to do this in 25 or 30 countries where there's ongoing level, dis disparate levels of violent conflict. 
Yeah, well, you know, the thing about any typology is that typology is putting squares, lines, cells around continuous variables. So the, I do not think I have insight into the challenges and the problems of Somalia. I'm not sure how much insight. Nobody else does. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the world, the, I have to say the World Bank tried to write a world, de a world development report on the issues surrounding conflict. And when I read it and you asked me what did it actually say, it said things get better cumulatively if you can just get started. But beyond that, it didn't have anything really interesting to say. I'm probably being a little unfair. I can see you nod because you know it. Okay, thank you. But I don't have anything to offer in that. But and somewhere when you move along that spectrum, you get to the Malawis of this world. And the Malawis of this world are not countries that would be rated as countries in conflict, but they struggle. You know, the risks of implosion are real. There was a piece that was written by DFID, actually. They did their Drivers of Change series, and they wrote this in 2004. And it was called Malawi on the brink of being a failed state. Now, just in the nature of the way these things emerge, the leader who then became the prime minister, whose name was, what's he? Hmm? No, no, not Mulizi. The guy, the, the guy who was the, the, the one with the brother. Oh, Mutarika. Uh, Mutarika. So Mutarika wins an election. He wins the election. He's president. intended to be president. He, he's intended to be the puppet of Mulizi. He turns out to be a strong, determined leader. He, he becomes, for a very brief period of time, a developmental hero, actually, to the point that Robert Zellick goes and pays a visit to him in Malawi. Then he tries to consolidate power and block the electoral process. Chaos breaks out in Malawi. He dies at just the right moment. And Malawi finds its way comfortably back into that bottom left cell of my, fr of my frame. So, so I tell those two stories to both to say, yeah, there is a class of countries that are in deep conflict, and I don't think I have anything to say. But then if you move along that spectrum, they're the Malawis of this world. The Zambia, I mean, in the book, I talk not just about Bangladesh, but in depth in Zambia, about Zambia. And the Zambias of this world that are low income, their institutions by any measure are relatively weak and personalized, but I think maybe there is something to be said. So that's just the limit of what's here. Great, thanks. Thanks for the question. Should we move on? No, here, please. So my question may be just anticipating what you want to move to, but this seems like, I understand what you're saying, and it's probably more effective to deal with what you, the, the, you know, the development of the, the, the um, um, system, I'm sorry, or the development with the resources the, you have, the, the state you have, uh, yeah. the state exactly. you wish you would have. Right, exactly. Um, so it's a bit of a cop-out, though. I mean, it's, it, it is realistic, um, but um, does that mean that a bit, I mean, you're going to have tremendous weight, oh. with tremendous corruption in this, and there's, there's not necessarily a reason to think this is going to have more effective. So I'm, I, let's, I let's, I, I want, I, I'd be thrilled for us okay. to have that conversation at the end yeah, of the talk. That's, 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 that's where I'm headed. Yeah, yeah that, that's where I'm headed. You're skeptical. Like you're, yeah, I'm you're skeptical. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you're, you're, I like that. My, the question that I'm going to throw back to you later, but I may as well leave it with you now, is so what really is the alternative? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I, when I teach, I tell all my students the classic job, a cl classic joke about the, the economist and the can opener. Did I tell it? Yeah, sure. Okay, why not? Um, <laughs> so, you know, the economist, the physicist, and the chemist wash up on a desert island. And they got no food and they're starving to death. And they wake up one morning and it turns out that a crate has washed up on shore. You don't know this joke? Crate has washed up on shore and you open the, and it, outside the crate they're incredibly excited. It says food. And they open the crate and what do they find? They find cans. It's canned food. So the physicist immediately gets to work. As the sun is up there and he's looking for versions of glass particles. Can he find something that can concentrate the light enough to be able to get through the can. He's working and he's trying hard. The chemist is rush rushing around the riverbeds, looking at various compounds, trying to figure out, can he find something that he can put together that would corrode through the cans? The economist is sitting quietly under a tree. 
you know, and these other two, they're busy, and this guy's kind of sitting there, and he's relaxed. And they say, what, what are you doing? Are you going to starve to death? He says, no, this is an easy problem. How do you solve this problem? Assume a can opener. <laughs> okay? So if we assume that we can fix, if we, if we assume we can fix that in reasonable order, then we don't have a problem. But if this is the world that we're in, the question that we're wrestling with... There's nothing that can be done. To well, not nothing. No, not... Uh, this isn't a, the, what is there that can be done? And so that's where we're going. And the question, in fact, that we're asking... Please, one more and then... Yeah, so, so just before we proceed, just so I understand your use of the monologue a little bit. So, so maybe why we're here, the reason we need to use the biological expectations of the person, not the puppet, that we need to use the puppet in the game. And in your story, the monologue would be transferred from the lower left-hand corner to a different quadrant in your psychology? Well, m um, I know, no, it's a, it's a good question. Mutarika aspires to move to the top left quadrant. He aspires to consolidate power, to manage and control an election. His aspiration is to become the Hastings Banda of the next period. So, I mean, I, a theme that, you know, and by the way, Bangladesh is fascinating if we pose it because that same aspiration keeps, keeps appearing. I mean, a, a really, really troubling question, which is in the background, and it's actually tied to what you've said, and I think we're going to ask that. At the end of the day, when we look at the question, when we look at what is workable in this kind of environment on its own terms, do we wrestle with this incrementalism to achieve cumulative incremental gains, or do we reach a conclusion, which if you like, I mean, that's setting aside um, Mutareka's own lust for power, the conclusion is we can't get there from here, we've got to move from there to there. Okay, now I, having wrestled a lot with this, having wrestled a lot with this, I, I have taken the following personal view on this, which is maybe, maybe when all is said and done, we can't get there from here, but, that, but I am not going to do in my work, work that says that's the conclusion. What I am going to do, and it's part of the, part of, if you like, the, the goal of this, is I am going to step back from the hubris of asserting that countries that are in that space mustn't be. So, for example, I would not say what Bill Easterly has said about Ethiopia. Okay, so Ethiopia is a country which clearly is in that top left quadrant. And it's a country in which over the last two decades in the book somewhere there's some data, has actually achieved unprecedented gains in growth and human development. So Bill Easterly turns around and he says, I think that it's a crime that the United States and other um, donor agencies support a country which is not democratic. Okay, now what, I just want to finish my thought. Now what is Bill Easterly actually saying? Because if you have to ask what's the counterfactual, the counterfactual of Ethiopia being in this space is not being in this space. The counterfactual of Ethiopia being in this space is being in this space. So I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm not going to take the Belisley position, but what I have, but what I am going to do, and it's the focus of the book and it's the focus of the thrust of my effort, is to ask, given what the world looks like in these settings, and given a commitment not to do what Mutarika wanted to do, which was to move back up. What can be done? And that's so just to summarize, we couldn't use the theory of the stationary bandit. Um, who's your station? Your stationary bandit is the top left. Well, remember that we know that you know five five out of six stationary bandits will produce disaster. One out of six will be developmental. Okay, that's you know I'm, I'm not I'm not going to give you the I'm not going to say the stationary bandit will solve it. If you want to press. And you want to ask, is the non-developmental stationary bandit better than personalized competition? If you want to try to make that case, explore it. See where it leads you. That's not where I'm going. Where I'm going is to ask, what can we do when we find ourselves in this setting? Because what I think it is, and I think this is a profound and fundamental difference, it's, it's the heart of the development question for those of us who are committed to both de development and democracy. And it's a question which we've evaded. 
We've evaded it because we've assumed can openers. We've assumed that there's an easy way if one only moves from there of going there. But then we're looking at, and no, notice there, this space exists too, but we're talking about this class of countries. This 30 or 40, this dozen countries that have grown, and we're asking how and why. Okay? Thanks. That was a, th those are both useful interventions. So let's move on. And I want to move on. I want to, this is a, at one level, it's simply a variant of what, I just, uh, what I put up earlier where I talked to, you know, you remember I had, a, I had these same axes earlier and I had the Korean version of strong ca public capacity producing growth, producing strength in private sector. But this is another way of taking that same frame but leading it in a different direction. One of the really interesting areas of work in recent decades in development policy making was the work done by Danny Roderick, Ricardo Hausman and others around binding constraints approachment, approaches to development. They argued in that work that contrary, I think Danny was quoted as saying you know, what the Washington consensus was, it was akin to, you know, you have a vast menu of reforms and you, it's like throwing spaghetti on a wall to see what sticks. You try them all and if any, and Having something stick is better than having nothing stick, so you just try them all. They say, well, that's not helpful. In environments where the capacity to affect change is limited, it is much more helpful to ask, what, what's binding? Where's the place, if you can only address that, you can achieve more gains? That rather than somewhere else. And having identified that, he goes on to say, we need to distinguish between function and form. Let's not rush in with our view of the specific way in which the specific problem should be addressed. Let's know that the goal is to try to catch the mouse. And it doesn't matter if the cat is black or white as long as it catches mice, to take a phrase that we all know. So it's a way of saying, and what this is a way of saying, is let's think of our development strategy as firefighting. What we want to do is we want to keep maintaining forward momentum. And we want to keep maintaining forward momentum by whatever is most binding at a particular point in time. Let's try and address that. Let's address that as best as we can. Let's move forward with that as best we can. And when something else becomes binding, then we address that. And the, the spirit of the idea is that if only that were doable, then gradually, cumulatively, and incrementally, you could start moving in that direction. The questions that arise though are first, so what are these second best, nth best options in each of these? And critically, is it true? Is it true that if you adopt in these settings development as firefighting, you can actually progressively, chaotically, seemingly chaotically sustain that forward momentum? And so I'm going to go into what each of these look like. These are each chapters in the book. So there's one chapter in the book which talks about aspects of private sector development and inclusive growth in difficult environments. And we'll sp I'm going to give you the two-minute version of what's in that chapter in a moment. There's another chapter in the book which talks about active citizenship, um, transparency and participation. In each of these, as you're going to see, we're looking at these relatively modest initiatives. Um, that might maybe are just enough to firefight the problems as they arise. You should probably go to the final round of uh, questions with him no later than 10 minutes. No problem. We're, we're on track. We're on track. Um, third, third space is this one. What about incremental approaches to public management reform? So let's look at what we know about the agendas of each of those, and let's, then let's build it back up again um, from there. And so let me start with inclusive growth. Turns out that the agenda of focused strategies that can accelerate growth without reforming the business environment as a whole is quite expansive. Export-driven development in many settings was done without broad-based trade policy reform. The Bangladesh example is a really intriguing one. Bangladesh's growth is actually driven by huge gains in exports in the garment sector, which were not about driven by broad-based improvements in the business environment. There are very, very specific initiatives targeted at creating the space for garment exports to grow. Very interesting political economy of why it worked. You can do the same thing, and chapter 10 of the book explores, by 
local initiatives involving smallholder farmers and agro-processors, or by mechanisms of credible commitment that can attract investment, even if your property rights system as a whole is not functional. These are all second best options. They're explored. They're, none of them involve a level playing field in the liberalized environment. So that's one set of options. Notice they're all on this left-hand side of that spectrum. Narrow the agenda so that you can do something feasible without the broad-based con confrontations. Now let's look at the second area, the area of active citizenship around, and particularly the use of transparency and participation. One might have thought that, and that transparency and participation are motherhood and apple pie of development. Of course, we want initiatives that involve more citizens, more transparency, more participation. In practice, though, this has become very contested space. There are debates on the efficacy of what's done. There are debates on the mechanisms through which the results are achieved. There are debates on what is the long-run value of all of this. And as of late 2014, the protagonists of using micro-initiatives to support transparency and participation are very much on the defensive in the development discourse. In the chapter in the book around this, I explore that in the context of two broad spaces, participatory, participatory approaches to service provision involving participatory approaches to school governance, community-driven development initiatives. As I judge the evidence, it's actually this is a half full glass. The evidence suggests that in some contexts these are promising, but not others. More on that in a second. Same thing, also part of the discussion in the book, using the use of public information as pressure for performance. Once again, the evidence is mixed, but the critical point to be made is this discourse has been a very primitive discourse. The discourse has been one of competing examples. I like participatory approaches to school governance, so I will give you the case that works, or the RCT that works. Someone else doesn't, so they will give you the case that doesn't work. What we need is the framework for understanding what are the transmission mechanisms that produce different outcomes. And I explore in the book how you might move that forward. There's also this big question, which is, even if you get these things working, do they have knock-on effects? You might be able to get some schools working better, but are there, is, th is this actually translating into active citizenship, which is more broadly transformational? You might get community-driven participatory initiatives working around local infrastructure, but do those translate into broad-based improvements in democratic accountability and local governance? Again, it's a theme that I pick up in the book. Third area to look at in terms of these micro-level incremental initiatives around public management. So the public management space is another difficult and contested space in development policy making. The basic idea has seemed straightforward. The basic idea is we know what a Weberian public sector look like, looks like. It involves functional alignment. It involves merit-based recruitment and promotion. It involves monitoring in the basis of results. So let's just do it. The evidence is it doesn't work very well, especially, especially the evidence is clear, it doesn't work in these contested settings. To the point that a review that was done of in the space involving Frank Fukuyama said maybe the World Bank should stop trying to fix public administrative systems. But curiously, every now and then, notwithstanding the basic view that says you've got to fix the public management system as a whole, there have been much more narrowly focused incremental appro approaches to public management reform. And the evidence of many of these, focus smaller, focus in a more um, precise way, is that sometimes they seem to achieve significant results. Even more interestingly and more provocatively, and I'm going to use this to bridge into the very last part of what I want to cover, are examples where you get islands of effectiveness that are driven by very proactive public officials. Public officials who choose not to wait for their principles in the hierarchy to tell them what to do, but to choose to shape goals for themselves, who choose to build teams for themselves, and who choose to build the external alliances that can hold this together. I'm going to come back to that. 
But now I'm going to get to the last part of the talk, which addresses, sorry, what was your name again? Catherine. Sorry? Catherine. Catherine, which addresses Catherine's question, which is this. What I think the evidence tells us is that these individual islands, skillfully designing along that spectrum that I described, can be effective. But the question that arises is, can islands-driven cumulative incrementalism, trying to move, can that sustain democratic development? And when you ask that question, what you want is you want to ask, is there an example that you can find of this kind of incremental cumulative process playing out over 40 or 50 years? Obviously, it can't be Indonesia because the process is too new. You could, we could look usefully at India, but India, I think most would argue, has certainly not moved all the way to that impersonal space. The issues around corruption and dysfunction continue to be endemic. But there is an example. The example that you can look at that has moved effectively is along that space that has managed to make this migration is this country. The Americans... That Frank also uses it. Yeah. It's the American spoil system. The United States in the 1870s was a setting where all positions in the federal government were patronage positions. When the opposition party won the presidency, everybody got fired in the post office. Everybody got, if you were in the post office, you had your job, you lost your job, and you got your job back again over a seven year period as the administration alternated from Republican to Democrat back to Republican in the 1880s. If you were an employee, you had to give t up to 10% of your salary as your party contribution. Turns out that three quarters of the financing of the Republican Congressional Electoral Fund in the 1880s came from subventions from people who owed their jobs to the public sector. And this changes incrementally and cumulatively over 50 years. There is a top-down reform. It's the Pendleton Act. The Pendleton Act passed in 1882 introduces meritocracy, but it only applies to 10% of public officials. It takes another quarter century before it reaches 60% of the public service. What's interesting about this story, and it's, it's one that is particularly well told by um, Carpenter in his book, the, is it called The Origins of Bureaucratic Autonomy in the US, is that it was a series of bottom-up initiatives by public officials who, by the quote, usual standards of the role of the public sector, were overstepping their mandates big time. They were, not only were they doing what they quote should be by building internal capability, but they were building external alliances. They were building alliances to be able to block and trump Congress when Congress tried to change their mandates. There's a quote in Carpenter's book about Harvey Wiley. He you know, says, by, by 1892, 10 years into his job, Harvey Wiley was taking agendas and setting, was taking orders and setting agendas from nobody but himself. Okay, so that, and it had got to that space. But that, and that, but and that was the process of change in the US. So just to think about that in the frame that we had a moment ago. So what drives the progressive era in the United States? Turns out there's a 60-year boom in the country. But from the mid-1860s to the mid-1920s, the US economy, it's startling when one looks at the decadal growth rates, consistently grows real terms 4% per annum. That 4% per annum is associated with urbanization, the growth of a middle class, the growth of deep social dislocation and discomfort, and the rise of the progressive, progressive era movement. The rise of social reform movements, public entrepreneurship, pressures for change, which in a sense are leveraged by these public entrepreneurs to progressively strengthen the bureaucracy and over the course of that period this continues with progressive cumulative feedback. But I don't want to leave and I don't want to end with a excessively, even if it's imperfect Pollyanna, a sort of an excessively seemingly over optimistic story. I want to, I want to end with some questions and some puzzles. I want us, because I'm, I'm really eager for us to talk about these. And we'll call them the dilemmas of what I've described, the just enough governance pathway of democratic development. When I, I did a version of this presentation to some of your and Frank Stanford students a few weeks ago, and when I used the, 
your honor students. And when I spoke, to Frank's comment to me afterwards was, he said, yes, he says that's true about the United States, but remember, in the US, it played out against the backdrop, backdrop of a strong rule of law. And in many other settings, that's not going to be there. So the first question is, does pressing on each of these, does development strategy as firefighting in these environments, is it sufficient to get cumulative gains? We don't know. Even if it were, is it politically workable? Can political leaders and donors, and if you like, the global order more broadly, live with an approach to development strategy that says we don't have the can opener that we want? We have to work modestly and incrementally and cumulatively. Well, that's politically an unworkable agenda. And if one does go down those paths, what are the longer run implications? Are the gains that it offers, are they good enough gains? Or by choosing a more limited agenda, are we selling short by refusing to press for more ambitious goals? Are the risks of reversal with that limited agenda too high? Or to put it differently, are we better off pursuing lower probability but higher benefit options? Now, where I came out when I first started thinking and talking about the book, I viewed this, this, la this is my last slide, I viewed this sentence that you're going to see in a moment as a troublingly bleak view of development. Through the lens of the journey that we've just been on, I actually view it as optimistic. And so here's where I came out, which is the development dilemma that we confront, as I think of it, is this. As long as inclusive growth is rapid, which means that we're seeing the economic and the social transformation, perhaps a seeming excess of order, a la Ethiopia, or a seeming excess of chaos, a la Bangladesh or Zambia, may be less a signal that a country is off track than part of the medium-term nature of things as this development process unfolds. So I'll end there. Thank you. <laughs>